Hi everyone, this is your chess puzzler. This special edition is on Li Chao and his game against Elyanov of round 7 of the 2017 Sharjah Grand Prix. Just like the majority of rounds and for example round 1, round 2, round 4 and round 7, there have been only 2 wins per round and guess what? On average there have been 2 wins per round. Round 7 has been no different and followed the exact same trend. The two winners from this round were Salem, who started the tournament in the worst possible way, losing two out of two games. He then stabilised and ever since he remains undefeated. Li Chao too started with a loss and other than his loss against Nepomniachtchi, a game you will find in the Sharjah playlist, and in the special editions playlist, he too has been very hard to beat. In his game of round 7, he has shown how good he can be, and you will see how he completely busted Elyanov, a player well above his ELO. But time and time again, ELOs do not necessarily mean too much at this level of play. The history between the two is as good as non-existent. They only met twice before, both times in 2016 in Norway, one of which was under blitz conditions. This ended in a draw and the other game, Lee had won with the black pieces in a relatively long game of 57 moves. Their Sharjah 2017 round 7 game was the first time Lee was taking the white pieces and in this tournament, Alyanov was looking very forward to getting his revenge. Having this information in mind, we can now look at their game. It started off with d4, knight f6, c4, e6, going for the near Indian, knight f3 and b6. With b6, we know and do expect black to fianchetto, and though there is no need to bring his bishop out right away, Alganov did this anyhow in his next move. Lee used the Petrosian variation above others, a variation Kasparov used in his heyday, and you will find this opening as the Petrosian variation. What this move does is very simple, and White wants to get the knight out onto c3 without being harassed by the bishop pin on b4. So if you like, if we were to redefine the opening conventions, we would call this the Petrosian defence rather than a variation because it has a defensive nature. Anyhow, after bishop b7, the knight came out to c3 and Elyanov followed on with the normal line of play, d5. There are thousands of games with this opening and as we have looked at in many of our previous games, a d5 move aims to open up the centre. Not obliged to take, Lee took anyway on d5 and the knight recaptured. Recapturing with the pawn is fine too, but many players do choose to take with the knight. e3 led to bishop e7, bishop b5, c6 and the bishop back to d3. Did White lose a tempo here? It depends on how you want to see things. c6 does block the bishop's axis, but Elyanov resolved this problem with c5. White castled, and on this move, we have the first pawns being exchanged on d4. Very little is happening so far, but normally these lines of play and positions are what we call calm before the storm. Knight bd7 got the queen to e2, which is not a move I would normally see or expect. Black castled, and Lee got his knight to e4, and again, I cannot say for sure what he intended here, other than looking to find a better outpost for him. Knight f6 tells us Elyanov was not happy with the knight being on e4 
and wanted most definitely to get him either repositioned or removed. With the return of the knight to c3, we knew Lee had no intention of trading in his knight. Queen c7 was long overdue, but better late than never. Elginov played it. Lee shot his bishop off to g5, but was not making any progress because he did not have a clear plan or not one that I could work out. h6 pushed the bishop back and with this move maybe the idea was to weaken up the king side. It is always our instinct to try and kick any pieces that are in our camp even when they pose no real and immediate danger. With queen f4, things began to get hot, but bishop g3 chased after the queen, leading her to g4. Lee chose bishop a6, challenging the exchange, and here Elyanov could simply have taken on f3, because after the queen recaptures and queen takes, g takes queen will land white with a double pawn. This would not be too bad, but if you go back just before the queens came off and black goes for the pawn on d4, he has it coming. Rook d1 will be a big blow for the queen as she only has two squares to choose from, one g4 and two c5. We can look at both of these options in turn. With queen g4, we get to hear this. because the exchange on g4 drops that lovely looking horsey on d7 and the blow is too severe for black to make a comeback. With queen c5, any ideas on what white should or could play in 3, 2, 1? Try b4 and the queen is running out of space very quickly. Queen h5 results to the same outcome as before because once the knight vacates f6 to recapture, there goes again that knight on d7. If now we try queen g5, white can easily go for this daring move, queen b7, and has nothing to fear. If rook fb8 worked, we could try it, but it loses to bishop takes and black is gone. Since rook fb8 does not work, nothing works, because nearly all the black pieces are tied up, rook fd8 will invite knight b5, and the problem with this move is that black will not be able to survive. e5 can allow f4, and once the exchange takes place on f4, a bishop capture will force the queen to h5, and with no interruptions, White can easily start removing pawns through knight takes a7 and one by one the board begins to clear up. After g5 and bishop g3, black has nothing to play for. Moving any of the knights will drop the other and if the queen moves to g6, knight to c6 will push the bishop back to f8 but this will drop the rook on d8. If you think the rook should come to the bishop's rescue and try rather than bishop f8 rook e8 this situation gets worse because after knight takes bishop check should the rook recapture queen takes rook check sorts out the game once and for all. We can now come back to this position and try yet a third option, the queen to f5. Queen f5 is not better than the other options because after the queens come off, rook fe1, rook fe8 and bishop b7, black is again going to lose some piece. A rook escape to d8 is no escape because bishop c7 determines the rook's fate and once again black loses. So coming back to this very move, the queen is much better off taking on f3 
rather than going for the poison pawn on d4. Fortunately or unfortunately, Alyanov did not capture on f3, but took on a6, and when the queen recaptured, the queen found a new spot so that she could no longer get trapped. White carried on with rook a c1, and Elyanov, being fearful of Lee's queen, wanted her so badly and was willing to trade his own through something that looked like a very poor move. Queen a5. Take the queens off, and though black ends up with a double pawn, you will be doing black a favour because he can and will be taking advantage of the open space he has now created. For this reason, Lee rejected the offer and went for queen b7. Rook f e8, knight d2, bishop f8, h3, queen back to f5, knight c4, a6, rook f d1, b5, explaining the a6 move, knight e3, queen h5, bishop c7, and queen g6, showed Elyanov to be completely lost in a game he loves above all. Lee prevented b4 by taking that square himself, and with knight h5, Elyanov hoped to create his first real threat. Lee repositioned his knight to e2, and Elyanov was beginning to plan his attack on the white king by getting as many pieces together as possible onto the king side. His knight move from d7 to f6 was yet another preparation for his attack. Rook c6 was a magnificent move by Lee, and what this move does, it encourages black to try knight e4. Elyanov missed this move to queen g5, but please do not ask me to explain why he chose to get his queen on this square, because I have no idea. Bishop e5 that followed was as bad because no one would want to trade in his bishop for a knight and relinquish control of the dark squares. To me, this move makes no sense at all. a5 was followed by queen takes, a takes and a takes, and black suddenly and out of nowhere manages to get right into the game. What Black could not accomplish before, he does now, because it did, in the end, open up some files. Being too eager to make use of the open files, Rook a2 led to Rook c2, and with Rook e a8, Black was far better off when compared to a few moves earlier. The exchange on a2 got the queen to c4, rook b2, b5, knight d5, knight takes and e takes, and through queen d3, queen g6, queen takes and f takes, Lee found himself back into the driving seat. Knight c3 was the beginning of the end for Elyanov, because the whole idea of the knight coming to c3 is to home in the pawn. Rook b3 attacks the knight, and Lee rushed to protect him by getting the rook behind him. In fact, Lee did not really rush the move, because he took his time here. But if you take back this last move, would you be able to find a more attractive one in 3? 2, 1, and this move is, in my opinion, would have been better. Rook b1. Should the rook take the knight, the pawn finds b6, and after knight f6, b7, and knight d7, rook b5 is a killer move. King f7, rook takes, knight b8, and certainly not bishop takes, but rook d8 does the trick nicely, because with knight a6, 
Rook a8 going after the knight. Rook b3. Rook a7. Bishop e7. f3. Rook b5. And a very, very tricky sneaky move. Bishop d6. Black is doomed whether he takes the bishop or not. Take the bishop and the pawn promotes to a queen with a discovery and it's game over. If now rook b1 check, and this is before the promotion, white must come to f2 because king h2 will lose due to bishop takes check and it is black who now wins. King f2 wins easily because after rook b2 check, king e3 and rook b6, things become very clear. Should white take the bishop, white still wins, but he will need to deal with this cleverly found move. Rook e6 check, and whatever white does, the bishop is gone. This end game was avoided when rook c1 was played, and we can continue from here. Elginov came with his most aggressive move in the game and went for the rook on c1 through this move, bishop a3. But if you look at this move, however attractive it may look, it does deserve this sound. Because rook b1, the move he missed earlier, was found now, and by taking the knight, that pawn began to make his way to promotion. First, c6 was played, and after knight f6 and b7, knight to d7 looked just good and strong enough to kill off the promotion. There is only one move to guarantee a win for white, and I would like to pass this on to you to find it in three, two, one, nothing else other than this move, rook b5 helps, and if you found it. With nothing left to play for, knight d7 was also Elganov's last move, and after having seen rook b5, he just resigned and congratulated Lee for beating him. What a game this had been. Lee having lost his last game against Nepomniachtchi in round six was very determined not to let anyone else beat him twice in a row and certainly was not going to let Elyanov, a player who is yet to score a victory against him. With this significant win over Elyanov, Lee's found within striking distance of the leaders with three and a half points, while at the same time, Elyanov's defeat leaves him one place above the very bottom, and with only two and a half points, he's the only player who is yet to achieve a single victory in this tournament. With two rounds to go, and as you can see, the standings at the top have not changed, but many things are still possible until the very last round. I would like to thank you for taking part, and as usual, I would like to thank everyone who watched this clip. I will be back to cover the most important games in this tournament until the very end.